We're live, Brandon. I am live. Well, um, everyone be warned, you might be on camera. Uh, hello. I am Brandon, your author for the evening, and I am doing something a little bit odd this time. Uh, because we are under a mask mandate uh, here in Utah, which is a good thing, um, to keep six feet away from people, um, what we're going to do is, instead of people handing me stacks of books to sign, I'm going to sign a big table of books, and then I'm going to go somewhere else and sit down, and then the team is going to come magic away these books and replace them with other ones for me to sign. Uh, this is because we were worried that uh, if I had a mask on, it might muffle for the stream, and this way I can stay well beyond six feet from everyone else. So, you're going to see me moving between locations today as I sign uh, various random things. Uh, thanks for showing up and uh, hanging out with us as I sign books. Um, and we're going to be taking questions and answering them. And, um, yeah. I also, I think I have some, of the, some things to show off of from the Kickstarter rewards that Isaac has put uh, for me to show everybody. Just kind of the final versions of some of these things. We've gotten samples in of some of the pins and things like that. So I'll let you guys see that. Um, but anyway, yeah. Oh, I should probably announce that Don Shard is out. In case you haven't uh, gotten that information, we have uh, the Stormlight novella available. That's link it. in the description. Sorry. Link in the description. Adam will put a link in the description. Are uh, we there? Already there. So you can buy yourself a copy of Dawn Shard if you didn't get one through the Kickstarter. We worked very hard to get that out before Rhythm of War comes out. Uh, and, and these are not the hardcovers. This we're talking yes. about the ebook e for, for people commenting. Yes. We're getting doing the ebook. Yeah, the hardcovers are gonna take a long yeah. while. January, February is the last yeah. I heard. It's uh coronavirus has slowed down a ton of the publishing industry. Uh, I believe I mentioned it on our last stream, but we kind of dodged a bullet. Rhythm of War. Uh, thing, books were getting pushed back and dropped right and left uh, as printing shortages happened. But Tor managed to push this one through. So we will be releasing Rhythm of War on Tuesday, five days away. Um, and in the meantime, you can tide yourself over with a novel form appetizer um, in uh, Dot Chart. So there you go. Uh, we we oh. apologize, uh, the stream mascot, uh, Magellan the Macaw, will not be joining us tonight because we have to do a dual camera thing with this, and I'll be moving around a lot, and that might have involved the Macaw flying around the room trying to find me, so. Uh, and uh, Matthew from the Facebook chat's wondering if we have an update for when the Don Chart audiobook will be released. Uh, uh, no specific date on that yet, because we're hoping yeah. to get... Uh, Michael Kramer uh, and Kate Redding involved on that, and uh, they have a very full schedule. Yep. Our plan right now, if we can pull it off, <coughs> we are looking at doing a print release for those who didn't get it through the Kickstarter and an audio release at the same time, sometime middle of next year. That's not a promise, but that's what we're looking at. Um, ideally, we would have um, a... a uh, Second printing of the the Don Shard hardcover and a audiobook already by about the middle of the year and then would release them at the same time. So uh, we shall see if we can make that happen. Again, things are kind of chaotic in the publishing industry like most of the world right now. Uh, but Rhythm of War audiobook should release simultaneously on Tuesday. And it should be a simultaneous release around the world yes. uh, for those who are doing a simultaneous release, I should say. So English yeah. language, I believe Spain is trying Spain to do it. Spain is, is planning on it. And so. I think, is Bulgaria trying as well? I don't know. I know a few said they wanted yeah. to try, but I don't know what their actual... It's uh, They're big books, and it's really yeah. hard to do a simultaneous... They have to translate the book in the time it takes us to basically get all the publishing ducks in a row in the U.S., which is quite the challenge. Spain got the first draft of the book and started working from that and then updated it each time we got, uh, I got a new draft done, which was quite a Herculean task. Um, so, kudos to them. Uh, let's do some questions, Adam. So, um, 
we're going to be starting with questions uh, that are left over from the last stream, but okay. I'll be pulling questions from the, the stream chats as I see okay. it. Questions that I like. Um, but our uh, friend of the program, who is very active in the, the chat every week, uh, and I don't know if I'm going to be pronouncing their name right, but Udi Kumra says, how do you decide at what point of the story to start the story? I always find myself starting either too early or too late, but never on time. You know, I have the same problem, um, and I don't stress about it, because I find that just getting started is the most important thing, and I'd say roughly half the time, um, my instincts are right where to start it now, and that's just gained over a, a long time being a writer and writing lots of stories, um, and about half the time, I'm wrong, and usually it's less a time thing and more a can I find the right tone and the right promises to do to start this book off? Um, and I am frequently wrong. And that's just fine because writing a new first chapter, once I finish the book and know for sure what the character arcs are and how the climax plays out, uh, you know, an outline, even a heavy outliner like myself, is going to change as I write the book. And so just being a, knowing that I can that I can change that first chapter is quite liberating, at least for me. Um, that I don't have to worry quite so much about the right beginning. A lot of authors stress the beginning of time because uh, they've heard you know you need to grab people fast. You need to have a good solid opening. In fact, a lot of my lectures I talk about making good promises at the start, but you don't have to do that in your first draft. And trust me, we often don't. Uh, you will read, uh, if you, if, for those who kickstarted Dawn Shard, um, I will be sending out the early drafts and you'll read that and find that I added an entirely different first chapter to Dawn Shard. Um, it was one of those, the 50%, that I started in the wrong place. And uh, this has just become so much a part of my process these days. Uh, that I don't worry about it. So I recommend don't stress it. Uh, oftentimes, if you're anything like me, you will know the end, the beginning of your book better once you have the ending completely set. Uh, Samuel Webb says, how do you write multiple projects while still being able to A, ensure their quality, and B, get them out in a timely manner? Um, so one of the things that I do, there's, there's a couple things that'll help with this. Uh, one is, I generally am not writing new fiction for anything but one project at a time. Uh, this is because um, just helps me keep my focus. Sometimes I can be doing revisions on something else while I'm writing new fiction. If I'm ever doing some new fiction on one thing and on another at the same time, it is because there are wildly different projects with very different tone and voice. Um, I find that one of the most important things for creating a story that we don't talk a lot about is the non-writing time that your subconscious spends working on your story. Those moments while you're taking a shower or driving to the store or things like this when, you know, you're kind of noodling on your story a little bit, um, but not really working on it. That time is really valuable, I have found. Uh, it helps problem solve and smooth out uh, character arcs and things like this. So when I sit down to write, I'm doing a better job of it. Um, and I find that if I divide my attention between multiple projects, in the moment, it's not as hard, but that subconscious time, that time that my, my mind is working, is then divided and just does not work as well. So I try to be focused on one project at a time. This means that when everything is working perfectly, I finish one project right when a revision needs to be started of another project. So I'm never even revising, if everything's perfect, a book while I'm writing on a new book. I'm doing one project at a time. Uh, this works just best for the way I am. Now, something that can mitigate that and help with that is if you happen to be an outliner, a really solid outline that you <coughs> have spent some of that subconscious time on that you have built that is really detailed. Um, it can be something that lets you drop a project and pick it up again, 
uh, much more easily. Doesn't work for everybody, right? Not everybody is an outliner. Not everyone uses this, the tools in the same way. Uh, and some people who are outliners, this might not work for. But I found, for instance, right now working on um, the new Skyward book, I had to do a really solid outline of, of Skyward 3 and 4 because I knew I was stopping for a Stormlight book in between those and it was going to be hard to get back into the world. Um, so I gave myself much better tools for doing so, which meant that I did a really solid outline. And I'm finding this outline is so detailed that it's a lot easier to jump around between things than it would be if I were not working from such a detailed outline. Uh, let's switch back to this. And everybody, you can come clear the table. Um, I didn't get the ones in the back row, That's so it fine. looks like I can handle That's about fine. two rows worth. So okay. I'm going to sign these things. What are these things I'm signing, Kara? Okay, so these are tip and pages for the Taiwan edition. Okay, the Taiwanese edition of uh, something. Shoot, yes, I just. <laughs> it's going to be. <laughs> I which one. Okay, well, a Taiwanese edition of one of my books. We are doing tip and pages for. Oh, it's Rhythm of War. Is yeah. it Rhythm of War? Okay, yes. so. Um, <laughs> so, I'm going to sign a bunch of these while they clear that table and uh, set it up with more books for me to sign, and then I will move back. Uh, you guys are very patient. Thank you. Um, so, um, try working from an outline. One of the things about managing projects, uh, the further I've gotten in my career, the more I've come to understand how much a writing day gets for me on average, and how much a revision day gets for me. Um, and it lets me plan my schedule out a lot better than I could earlier in my career. And I can say, all right, um, I'm going to work on this these three weeks. Um, and then I will be in a place that makes for a good stop. So that would be a good time for a revision to come in, or something like that. So um, planning, uh, this all comes from practice, though, and learning your own your own style, your own, uh, how the tools work best for you. Uh, and I saw a lot of people asking where to get uh, the books that you were just signing. Oh, yeah. uh, they will be up for sale on uh, your web store yep. uh, pretty soon, I'm assuming, Kara? Uh, it'll probably go up tomorrow. Probably go up tomorrow. Yeah. So if you're Maybe looking for a signed copy, copy tonight. Uh, I think he's going to be signing copies of Way of Kings. Oathbringer and Rhythm of War? All the Stormlights. Or, or Words yes. of Rage, oh, not, not oh. Rhythm of War yet. Not, um, uh, not Rhythm of War, sorry. We, I've um, been talking about that so much, it's hard not <laughs> to say it. So this is the thing. We generally um, don't sell the new hardcovers on my store uh, because we like to support our bookstore friends. Um, and we don't want to undercut them. Um, and so we would rather that when something like Rhythm of War comes out, the best thing you can do is if you have a bookstore, a local bookstore that you frequent, um, is to buy the book from them to support that store because we like stores staying in business. Uh, but once the book's been out for a little while, we put them up on my store uh, signed editions that you can get. We don't do personalizations very much anymore, right, Kara? No. Um, you know, once in a blue moon, perhaps, uh, we'll have a chance for personalizations, but that's just one thing that we're having to cut out as I become more busy. Uh, obviously, signing while I talk to you all is another thing we've had to do. Um, we probably would have to stop offering signed copies on my store if I didn't have a way that I could double use this time. Uh, because, man, things are getting really tight. Uh, because with me starting up Mainframe, which is an audiobook company, and looking at doing a, more with Hollywood directly, um, my time is getting m stretched really thin, uh, and so my non-writing time, I should say. We still, most of my time is spent writing. Thankfully. Thankfully. And I think everyone in the chat will agree yes. with me when I say that. Uh, what we do is I assign one day a week to not do writing things and to do other stuff, and so that day recently, uh, a lot of that time on Thursdays, which is the day we do these things, has been dedicated to a video game project, which I'm not at liberty to say what it is yet, I'm sorry, um, but um, that I've been working on for the last year. Someday that'll get announced, um, and doing live streams and interviews and all of this sort of stuff. It, uh, it 
I don't want to say that it's bad that you're so busy, but it will be nice when that uh, when your Thursdays calm down a little bit. Well, they never I, will because I'll put something else in oh, that slot. Oh, that's true. It'll be <laughs> true. from now on that the Thursdays or that slot is going to be if the video when the video game thing wraps up, it'll be movie stuff. Yeah. Um. So. Woo yeah. Woo Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. All right. Ready for another question? Yes. Um, Angela says, how do you come up with your believable backstories and characters? Do you have any tips for smooth execution of them? So, um, a lot of what we do that makes things smooth or work, uh, quote unquote, on screen, um, is all about um, characters making sure that it doesn't look like the author is doing things, right? Like, this is why it's kind of dangerous in some ways to watch one of these uh, streams and get the behind-the-scenes information because it pulls that curtain back. Uh, you see how the sausage is made. And for a lot of us writers, we go through a period where it's harder to read books uh, because now we see all the things that are being done rather than the story. Uh, for me, that lasted for a couple of years in college, and then I passed kind of beyond it to where... Now the way that an author is constructing a story is part of the joy. It's like I see a different layer. Uh, and I think I enjoy stories more than now than I used to. But regardless, um, what your goal is going to be here is to make things that are intentional not look at intentional or deliberate. Meaning, um, when, you, when the reader is reading, you're like, oh, now's the part where they explain the backstory. You have kicked them out of the story, they are thinking about the meta, con meta context of that story. Uh, am I coming back to sign now? We're, we're ready when you are. I don't know if you want me to give you a thumbs up. No, no, I, I can watch for it. I, I noticed, so I'm going to move back over. Um, so, what is going there on there is really keep the maintain the illusion. Um, and to do this with characters, I found that it, I have to change my mindset a little bit about characters. Um, I have to be thinking about the character, uh, as I often say, being the protagonist of their own story, regardless of who they are, in the story I'm writing, right? Um, and asking myself, what is the, was the character doing before the book started? Um, the book is, there's not a beginning to the story for the character. It's just a natural evolution of their life. Maybe something interrupted their life, yes, but... Uh, they don't know that they're starting a story, generally, when it starts. Um, they should be living their life, and they should be interested in things that aren't directly related to the plot that you are going to um, be sending them on. And this just kind of plays into this idea of letting everyone be the protagonist in their own story. They don't have to be, you know, the hero, but they are the protagonist, they're the person taking action. Um, and so believable backstory for me is wrapped up in this. Um, it's wrapped up in understanding that a character is not just one role in a story. Not writing them to a role, but writing them to a personality. Which means that uh, they will wear different hats in different situations like all of us do. Um, they will act differently in different situations. And making clear their motivations that will let the reader understand that so that the character doesn't feel schizophrenic, uh, unless indeed they are schizophrenic. Um, making sure that you know what this character would be doing. And I generally don't fill out a big dossier. Uh, I know some writers like dossiers, um, where it's like this, you can find these online. It's like, what is your character's favorite food? What is your character's uh, favorite movie, um, all of these sorts of things. I'm gonna kill that Sharpie. Goodbye, Sharpie. Um, and lean over and get a new Sharpie. And I don't generally do that. What I'm looking for is the kind of general rubric of the character's life. Uh, if I know the fundamentals, then I'll be able to answer the simple questions. Um, if I'm asked, you know, what would this character's favorite movie would be? If I know the fundamentals of who that character is, I feel like I could answer that. So I am looking for driving principles, uh, driving motivations in their lives, uh, things that change the way they see the world. How is the way they see the world different from me? And all of this 
is part of the backstory. And you generally will have times where you kind of info dump on that because <coughs> you can't avoid it entirely. But the more you can avoid it, the better. Um, so that if we can pick up from context that this is an experienced character who has spent a lot of time studying um, from the way that they talk to someone that they meet on the street rather than saying, she was a student at such and such university until blah, blah, blah happened and, and then she became a student at this university. Like if picking those things up in context is a lot of what makes books fun to read. As a, as a reader, being able to read and just get a sense for who the character is and what they've lived. And your job as a writer is to figure out how to do that in a way that makes it fun, makes it interesting, makes each character a little bit of a puzzle to figure out that the reader's subconscious is working on. Even while they're just reading about something else, they're picking up that this character's diction is just a little bit different. They choose different types of words and these sorts of things. That is what makes books fun. So, um, maybe that's a long, rambling answer to your question, but hopefully it's useful to you. Uh, Martin wants to know how often uh, characters' appearance should be described. Uh, this is actually very much according to personal taste. Um, so, character appearance is, um, is one of these things. Like, some authors really like to go into detail. Um, and other the authors like um, using simple brush strokes. There are people who, you can see this in visual art as well, that there are people who will um, do a very detailed painting. And another person who will do, with a few simple brush strokes, evoke the feeling of an elegant person going to a ball, but really hasn't gotten the details uh, of that down. And as a writer, this is one of the main things that will define your voice as a writer, is how much description do you prefer to use? Um, and there is no right or wrong answer about this. Generally, a lot of what uh, works as a model to start with and then explore other direction is to assume that you're going to do as little description mm -hmm. as is reasonable in the middle of um, conversation and dialogue, and you're going to try to interrupt the dialogue very sparsely, only with occasional beats. Uh, and a beat is the thing where you show what a character is doing to keep the story cemented in someone's mind. Uh, we call this, you can go re watch my lectures, they talk about something called the pyramid of abstraction. Um, and basically what this means is, a lot of detail up front or a moderate amount of detail up front about a character or any sort of setting detail, then it, you kind of solidify the scene in someone's mind by making it very concrete. A lot doesn't have to mean paragraphs and paragraphs. It can mean one or two really great lines that uh, really get across this character. Or it can mean a paragraph or two uh, if you're, that's what your style wants. And then you ease off on it and you guide us into a dialogue or an action sequence or something like that where they're keeping this image in their heads while you are moving on to the substance of the scene and then you will just use light little touches to remind the character to keep the, the reader or remind the reader keep them anchored in the scene uh, these little touches can um, help a great deal to just maintain you don't want to go up to the level you were before, you just want to keep it a maintenance level of keeping an image in the reader's mind, and then you ease out of that, and then you're going to change the scene usually in some way, and in that case, you're going to go back into the more descriptive method uh, where you are kind of pulling us back into the scene. After the somewhat more abstract sequence of people having a conversation and having the reader focus on the words rather than the actions. Uh, one thing that, <coughs> that some writers do that is just fine, but I uh, di dislike as a kind of stylistic choice, is where every line of dialogue is modified in some way by the character having a beat. Um, it starts to look in my head um, like, oh, some of those, those animations from the old CD Zelda game that you see as memes, where people are just always moving, 
And it actually is really distracting in animation if everybody is always moving. It looks strange to us. And if people, every line of dialogue, instead of focusing on the dialogue, you're pulling the reader's attention back to what is going on um, with the movements, then it's hard to focus on the dialogue. And instead, it's like you're seeing people dance and parade around. That's just my personal um, stylistic choice. And so I like fine touches to keep us cemented, uh, keep us hooked, keep, a, keep the image in our mind, um, bordered by more powerful descriptions at the beginning and the end. Um, one thing that people will recommend a lot for characters that I think is uh, a viable tool that you may want to practice with is giving a character some sort of identifying shorthand to remind us who they are. Um, this uh, sometimes backfires on you. For instance, Robert Jordan used the shorthand that Nynaeve is often tugging on her braid when she is frustrated. Um, I think it's an actually an excellent shorthand. It's one of the better ones because it says a lot about Nynaeve. If you haven't read these books, uh, keeping your hair braided in her culture is a sign that a woman has come of age. And wearing your hair loose means that you are childish uh, if you are a woman. And Nynaeve, though many of her, her friends uh, start wearing their hair in different styles as they explore the world, always keeps hers in the braid because she sees herself as the adult in the room. Uh, even among adults older than her, Nynaeve is the adult in the room. She also has temper issues. And tugging on her braid is a symbol of her aggression. Um, it's an action. It's, uh, it's actually a painful action. It's just a brilliant little tell for this character that conveys so many different things. Um, Robert Jordan used it well enough and uh, perhaps a little too often. I never felt like he did, but for some readers he did. And so it became a meme among Wheel of Time fans that people are always curiously tugging their braid. Um, and so you do have to be aware that that is the, the thing that can happen with tells, is they can become uh, a bit of a meme, but uh, I think it was used very well. And if you can come up with little shorthands like that, uh, one character, you know, will always be looking for something to snack on. Another character has this distinguishing mustache that they, that is always part of their description. Another character is always fiddling with the things that they find in a room in some way. You can make them subtle, you can make them overt. You know, this is the character who has bright red hair. Um, those tells help with the shorthand between given chapters. When you come back to a chapter, or particularly when you're in someone else's viewpoint and the character uh, walks onto the stage and you're like, who was this again? Oh yeah, red hair. That's the one that's like this. Got it. Um, so, uh, little character shorthands worth exploring as a tool to use, um, but do understand the, the drawbacks those can have. Am I still on screen, standing to yep. the side over here? You're Great. just good. I guess, just fine. I assume you would warn me. I would. Um, so, go ahead and fire off another one. So, PM says, do you find it more helpful when you discuss your books with others while writing them, or after you finished your garbage draft? Uh, definitely after I finished the garbage draft for me. Um, but, uh, I, being an outliner, any part of the process can be fine for me to talk about a book. Uh, it's more dangerous for discovery writers or those who are more commonly influenced by the ideas uh, of others to, to discuss the book um, while you're working on it. Also, a lot of uh, writers have this problem where if they talk too much about a book while they're creating it, um, they start to feel bored by that book. Uh, <coughs> more a discovery writer thing, but I think it could happen to anyone. Um, I am done with that stack. Uh, could you, the next stack, give me two rows, but pushed all the way to the back, because I signed them and moved them forward. Uh, I think that might work better. Get, let's give that a try. Okay, sounds good. Um, oh, Adam's got to have his monster. Yep, need some caffeine. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so, oh man, I lost the thread. What was that question again? Um, that question was talking to people before or after garbage. Yeah. Left. So, Generally, after is better for me. Um, the perfect world, honestly, is getting the book, having people read it while I work on something else, coming back to the book a few months later, rereading the book with comments, and then talking to people. Uh, that would be the perfect time. 
uh, to talk over changes I want to make and see what people think. I don't always have that luxury in my life right now, but I think that would be perfect. Um, Colton from the Facebook chat says, do you have any advice on someone thinking about getting into writing uh, on how they can develop a sense of good storytelling? Um, the two pillars of developing good storytelling are to read stories that you admire and to try writing them. Uh, you can also have the, the mini pillar of start to think about why authors made their choices and what deliberately um, doing the, making those choices does to a story. Uh, but really, there are a ton of writers who write purely by instinct. Um, it's actually been a really interesting thing on writing excuses, uh, having people on. Some people can speak very deliberately about their process. Usually there's people who have a, uh, an academic or uh, in some way um, education background, uh, but not always. Uh, these are people who have analyzed what they d have done and can, after the fact, talk about it. That is not an indicator of the quality of the writer. Some people who cannot speak about their process very well are excellent writers. Uh, the truth is that most of us do this by instinct, and then we analyze after the fact, or we analyze when something's going wrong, saying, man, what was wrong with my instincts this time? Uh, why did this turn out so poorly? Uh, and we just uh, we, we learn to talk about it afterward, and that can help us diagnose really handy. But if you want to be a great storyteller, the number one thing is just to write, to try a lot of different things out, and to then get responses from readers and see if you provoked the response that you wanted with that scene. And if you didn't, Ask yourself why. See if you can tweak it and get the scene to provoke the right response. It is a ton of practice and effort, um, and it is why there aren't a lot of shortcuts in becoming a writer. Uh, it is, you're going to take 10 years of your life and you're going to practice storytelling. But uh, reading good books that you admire and trying to analyze them can be helpful for a lot of us. So I recommend that. And when I say analyze, we're not looking for the author's themes or things like that. We're not looking for the English major things. We are asking ourselves, okay, what are the pieces of this story that author used? Why did the author use these stories? Or what do these pieces do in the story if I put them in mind? And what are some similarities this shares with other stories of this type? Uh, Drake says, uh, which do you prefer? To read and write a serious book with silly moments or a silly book? with serious moments. Uh, definitely for me, it is a serious book with silly moments. Which makes sense. You've done yeah. those a lot more. I mean, yeah. Alcatraz... Alcatraz is... is the only silly book with yeah. serious moments uh, series that I've done. Uh, and Alcatraz to this day is probably the book series of mine that hit the market the least, right? Uh, they're probably my least selling novels. In fact, not probably. They're sure to be my least selling. Uh, the only thing that is uh, kind of equivalent would be Legion, which we did all these novellas and then there's a collection and people weren't sure, is this a collection, is this a novel, what is it? Um, and so my, um, I did do during the years I was trying to break in a silly book with uh, serious moments and I was shooting for Pratchett and I ended up with Douglas, or not Douglas, uh, ended up with uh, Bob Asprin. Uh, and I like Bob Asprin's book, so that was fine. But it is not what I wanted to be known at for. Um, and uh, I felt like my talents were better suited to the other direction. Cooper says, when you are aware of certain plot or character arcs that needed some tweaking, such as, <coughs> excuse me, everyone, um, not enough progress for the payoff uh, they mm -hmm. were in, how do you determine what said fix should be and where and how to insert it properly without spending a significant amount of time? So maybe rephrased um, some simple yeah. tweaks, tools that people can use to fix their broken characters. Yeah, uh, particularly promise and payoffs is what uh, they are asking about. So yeah, um, this is a hard one to answer because the real answer is, well, practice a whole lot and see what happens, right? gain an instinct for it. Um, that unfortunately is the answer to a lot of questions in writing. So I'm going to try and give you some more detailed sort of things. Um, let's see. What do I normally do? 
what I normally do is I go back and I try to revise with a new theme for the character starting out that better hits the promises, and then I share that chapter with my team and say, does this fix the problem? Uh, is this better? Uh, in uh, Rhythm of War, for instance, uh, there were some things I wanted to do better with the character with uh, the character who has disassociative identity disorder, and I took the feedback from the betas, who themselves are experts in this area. I rewrote a chapter. I sent it and said, "What do you think? Better or what? What you want to avoid? Number one, you want to avoid making it worse." But really, you can usually tell the dangerous thing is taking sideways steps. Where you aren't making your story better, you are making your story different. And that can be dangerous because a lot of times it's very easy to just be writing a different story and to throw an entire plot line out of whack and end up with something that doesn't actually fix the problems you wanted to fix. It's just different. Um, and this I trust my beta readers on. I do it, and I say, what do you guys think of this? And see what the general response is to making tweaks. And the goal of making those tweaks and things is to get better at making future tweaks, right? Because not always do I have the chance to immediately show something to beta readers and get that response. And indeed, I can't generally show the whole book to the same people again and see what's happening uh, with all of the different changes I'm making. It's just too overwhelming to readers once I've made that many changes. And so the goal is to learn from each of those experiences. A lot of times what I'm doing is I'm changing the way the character interacts with the world, but I'm not changing many of the actions. The character's viewpoint on what is happening is often the most important thing for promises and payoffs. Having the character be focused and thinking about this is what we want to accomplish Sometimes when your promises are off, you just need to have them be thinking about a different thing or interacting with the problem in a different way. Sometimes it's simply them being frustrated that they haven't made progress yet so that you can have the character mimic the reader's emotions when they're getting frustrated. And the reader then is given permission to be like, okay, I'm supposed to be frustrated. There's nothing wrong with the book. This is what I'm supposed to be feeling. And when readers get that subconsciously, it helps with a lot of problems. Uh, granted, if what they find is they're supposed to be frustrated and they continue to be frustrated and the book is never satisfying, well, that's a different sort of problem. Um, but then maybe those are a few tips for you. Honestly, practice, revise, show your work to people after, after revision, see what kind of responses you get then. So the next question while you're moving mm -hmm. um, is from the YouTube chat from Alex. They say, how do you set up the right reader expectations when your beginning does not follow uh, one of the traditional tropes like boy on a farm? Right. Uh, good question. So this happens a decent amount of the time, right? Where your opening is the right opening you feel to introduce the character, but does not actually introduce the tone of your story appropriately. Um, or, you know, you've got a beginning that introduces the tone of the story, but doesn't actually accurately represent the character. And at this point, when these sorts of things are happening, you just are going to have to make some difficult decisions. Uh, for instance, uh, Way of Kings is a good example. Way of Kings begins in a way I wouldn't normally recommend people begin a book. Uh, this is where I am solidly making a bunch of different tonal promises and plot promises, and the character promise comes last of the, the intro. If you haven't read the book, it has a prelude and a prologue, neither of which are from the character's main, uh, main character's viewpoint, followed by a chapter one, which is also not from a main character's viewpoint, though the main character is in that chapter. Um, and it indeed is chapter four before we're getting to a main character's viewpoint. Bad idea, right? Normally. This is definitely breaking the rules. Uh, I could get... The reason I decided to do it, first of all, is because I felt that the tonal promises for the Stormlight were really important because I knew that Kaladin's arc at the beginning <coughs> wasn't a really great hook. Um, the beginning of the Stormlight Archive is about a character <clears throat> being beaten down, 
repeatedly in some pretty terrible ways and setting up his character and character arc in these kind of miserable circumstances. And for the book I was writing, granted there are people who write stories about people being miserable, and that's the point, um, and those can still be great books, but that was not really what this book was about. This book was about this character reaching toward a potential destiny that uh, was different from the way that the opening was treating him. How about that? Um, and I felt that the story needed to make these tonal prom promises early on so you felt like you understood where the book was going before I introduce you to, here's Kaladin, now watch him get kicked in the face for nine chapters. Um, I still stand behind that beginning, but the, the thing I had to understand is that the, the trade-off for that is it makes it much harder to get into the book than some of my other books, right? Uh, it is a book where you're going to get thrown at a huge world that's very different from our own and a large cast of characters pretty quickly. <clears throat> and if you put down the Stormlight Archive, it's usually in the first 10% or 20% of the book uh, because it's just overwhelming. Um, or, you know, you are just not able to connect to the characters. Um, and that is something I was willing to accept as the, <clears throat> the cost for earning what I thought would be a strength of the series, which is after experiencing all of that and having these promises at the beginning, the ending was that much more powerful. So basically, if you're going to start in a non-standard way, my recommendation is you understand why books don't normally start that way, see what you can do to mitigate the problem, but accept that as an aspect and attribute of your story and embrace it and make sure that, you know, the benefits of doing that are legit benefits to your story. You don't want to do one of these things and then not have the payoff for it. Um, and they each have kind of different potential payoffs in the story. So embrace it. Uh, don't stress that you aren't following the rules. As long as you know why you should follow the rules, you can identify that your story, just the, the piece of art you want to create, doesn't follow that rule. That's totally fine. In fact, it's encouraged. If every author's books followed all of the rules, then we would have very boring books a lot of the time. Uh, Hannah says, is there actually a wrong way to start a story? I've heard people say you shouldn't start by describing the weather or using dialogue. If it's pulled off in an interesting way, does this matter? Uh, no, there are no rules and there are no r wrong ways. There are rules of thumb instead is what I'd recommend. Uh, and it comes place to this last question. Why, uh, why do people recommend not doing this? Well, it's a couple reasons. Uh, I have never heard, don't start with dialogue. Uh, I <clears throat> think that a lot of very solid books start with dialogue. I wouldn't even call that one a rule of thumb. What's that? No, I'll be fine. I'll get it when I sit down. Uh, thanks for, for offering. Yeah. He, Adam was offering to, to bring me my water. Um, but I would say definitely, like, so here's the thing. You don't want to start your story with something that feels boring most of the, in, in most of the cases. Starting with a description of the weather is going to feel kind of boring. It's one of those just bland topics. Except Robert Jordan basically starts every book with a description of the weather, and it's great. Uh, he uses very evocative language, um, and it sets the theme for, and tone for his stories. Uh, some of the other ones they, they say not to do, uh, starting with the dream sequence, generally a bad idea. This is because uh, at the beginning of your story, your reader already doesn't know any of the characters or any of the situations. And so by presenting, in this case, the abnormal situation, a weird dream, the reader might latch onto things as promises in that dream and then be disappointed when it turns out none of that is what the story is actually about. They might feel cheated or they might just feel confused because they can't bond to this sort of surreal dream sequence opening. But I'm sure you can find fantastic books that start with a dream sequence. Um, starting with a character waking up generally 
frowned upon because it feels like a lazy way to start a book, and it is a way that a lot of new writers just start books. They're like, where do I start? I guess I'll have the character wake up. Same with the character start, starting the book by describing themselves in a mirror. These ones are generally frowned upon because they are done so often that they become cliches and therefore lose their impact and have a worse chance of hooking your reader. But I started Elantris with a character waking up, quite aware of the trope, and decided it was still the best opening for my story. Uh, not the prologue, but the chapter one. And so any of these things can be uh, just fine. There are no rules. Uh, just understand why people say, don't do this. If someone says, never do this in a story, you want to ask them why, but you also want to add an asterisk in your mind of, this one person doesn't think this is a good idea, but there are no rules. Uh, Thomas says, how do you make so many different distinct personalities for your characters? Um, so, I am always looking for conflicts. I find that personalities for characters growing out of conflicts is, for me, a great way to start to differentiate them. Um, and letting the con characters contrast against one another is another great way to do this. Uh, if you put two people in a room, they will have similarities and they will also have differences. And sometimes, by highlighting those differences, you can make both characters very interesting. Um, indeed, I talked about in the last one, you know, not starting your story with the, uh, with the outlier, the deviation that people can't latch onto. But sometimes, starting your book with a character who is a square peg in a rand hole, both tells us who the character is and a lot about the setting, right? Um, there's a, there's a, a book called, I think, it's called Spellright, um, about a magic system based on words, and it starts with a person who is trying to uh, use this magic, but I think has a reading disability. They're either dyslexic or they, um, they don't know how to spell or something like that. And yes, they are then the deviant, they don't do the magic well, but this is a great place where starting off with the exception to the rule actually makes a stronger story because you understand this person's conflict immediately and you understand your setting. Uh, in the same way, you can put two characters together and have them play off of each other. Make sure to avoid tokenism. Uh, when characters start to feel generic, it's often one of the problems is you are making a character represent an entire culture. Um, or an entire profession, or something like that, rather than in representing themselves. Uh, and this, this is a thing we do uh, in sci-fi fantasy, we have this problem, in that we often will have these cast of characters who are all from different nations or fantastical races, and these characters will all come to embody and represent the entire culture, but then they stop feeling like a person and start feeling like an archetype. Uh, and one of the easiest ways to make sure you don't do this is to put two characters into the situation um, and so that they um, can play off of each other. Uh, two characters from the same background who are also very different. Suddenly, you are forced as a writer to say, yeah, but who is this person? Not what's their culture, who are they? And that helps a ton. Um, but yeah, characters in con conflict Characters in contrast, uh, passions can work just as well, uh, and having a good mix of these. Being a good observer of person, of people, like asking yourself, what, what makes this friend of mine just really interesting to hang out with? How do they not fit the role that a lot of people would expect them to have in life? How are they in conflict with their society, uh, which is, you know, their setting? How are they uh, a great example of of what they're setting or society. How do they change hats when they are in different situations? Learning to observe these things and ask yourself these questions, uh, really handy for a writer. Uh, it does mean that your friends will end up in your books. Uh, so uh, they'll just have to be willing to deal with that. He uh, says, as he signs a book that has most of his friends in it okay. as members of Bridge Four. Uh, Voidsaver uh, says, um, 
I was wondering how the inside jokes and the acknowledgments got started. Uh, they noticed Isaac symbols first, and then Peter's interesting adjectives. Yeah. Uh, may, are there any others that maybe people haven't noticed? Uh, there's there's usually three. Uh, not in every book, but there's usually three. It started with Peter. Uh, Peter, before I was uh, uh, publishing books, um, was one of my very first uh, friends who was really good at editing and gave me a hand in being an alpha reader and things like this. And then he went off, got a job at the manga company, and I worked very hard to become a novelist, and he kept giving me feedback, even after we were in different states, on my books, and really was, in many cases, a better help than the editors that uh, were helping me with the books. Uh, he just has a really great eye for narrative. And so um, I started, uh, I thought, well, I, I want to put a special adjective for Peter. But Peter's a very special person. And anything I write here would just be normal. And what's that? I was going to say, can I just keep that? Scoot over, a little scoot bit? over. Got Sorry it. about that. Nope, you're just trying to get the door frame out. That is what your job is, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and so I came up with, what was the first one? Um, man, I don't he know has what the first a shirt. One is, but yeah. my favorite is Insoluble. Insoluble is one of my favorites. Um, but I came up with, a, it was one that didn't quite fit, but was weird. Uh, and I just put it for him. And then I basically just forgot about it, right? I, I, I put it in there, I was writing the acknowledgments, I was doing it really quick, but then I went to a book signing, and he thought it was so amusing that he made a t-shirt with it on it. It was like the inevitable, <laughs> inevitable Peter Alstrom, or the... Uh, it wasn't inevitable, it was something like that, though. Was it... Uh, insoluble? No, no, it was no, before no, no. Insoluble, I think it was before Inevitable. What, what book do you think it was? I, it was probably Elantris. Is either that or it was Alphatrax. Let's grab a, a... Can we get an Elantris copy? Yeah, uh, Alphatrax. Look, 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 it was... It started either Elantris, Alphatrax, maybe Mistborn. It was one of those... Or if someone in the chat has it handy, yeah. let us know. Um, the... Uh, but it wasn't... A, yeah, anyway. He came to the book signing back then. He, he was in L.A. And I think he came down to the Torrance borders when I was signing at Torrance. And he had a t-shirt made of it uh, that he just thought, he thought it was hilarious uh, and was confused. He's like, this word mean what you think it means? I'm like, yeah, I, it does. But, That's such a Peter thing to um, say. <laughs> uh, in fact, he, I think he actually sent me an email first, said, does this word make, mean what you think it is? And then when I confirmed I'd done it on purpose, then he got a t-shirt made. Then he, then, it, then he found it funny. And I'm like, well, I got to keep doing that, right? Um, and I've got to keep making them a little more ridiculous. Um, the only ones that aren't ridiculous uh, are the ones that are, there's a, one of the books is dedicated to Peter, and in that case, uh, I used real adjectives that actually describe him. Um, but, yeah, uh, what was it? It was something like Inevitable. Incalculable? Uh, incalculable! That, I think it is incalculable. Hydrostatic Shock 1. Yes, Incalculable. Which book was that in? Uh, a lot of people had it, actually. Yeah. Uh, he just is the first one I saw. It. Okay. Uh, I don't know... Oh, Mistborn. Mistborn? Okay, so we think it was Emma Mistborn. Escort. Okay, so, uh, incalculable. That's right. Peter is incalculable. Uh, and he's like, does this mean what you think it is? I'm like, yeah, it's, it's meant to be a little... Uh, yeah. And so he started wearing a t-shirt, so I started doing it with other books. Um, the second one was not actually Isaac. The second one was Ben Olsen. You might, if you've watched the streams a lot, he crashed the stream um, a month or two yeah, ago. Yeah, I think it was like number number 15 or something yeah. like that. He's with Dan, the Dan, Dan Wells. Dan Wells. He is a good friend of mine from college and then became my roommate. Um, and Ben is this interesting guy in that um, he kind of always has this air about him that he's just putting up with the rest of us. Uh, because Ben is... How to explain that? <laughs> ben is uh, wow. So Ben is as much of a nerd as the rest of us, but he doesn't have many of the nerd markers. How about that? Uh, ben is very deft in conversation. He is a great uh, snappy dresser. He is not sloppy. He keeps his room immaculate. He. Uh, Went and got a real job when Dan and I uh, and Peter, to some extent, went dancing through the clouds 
uh, chasing becoming these weird writer people. Ben is like, he, he, he has been a part of my writing group for like 20 plus years at this point. Um, and he always has this sort of, you goofy nerds, I guess I'll help you out. Uh, and then he gives really good feedback on my books, right? He's just, he's an excellent, and he really likes to, to, um, to tease us when he has an opportunity, but in a Ben sort of way, uh, which is less goofy and more serious somehow. He, I don't think he would agree he's serious, but that uh, is Ben. From the Twitch stream, yes. Oren says, uh, hashtag nerdcognito. Nerdcognito. Ben is nerdcognito. Great, great word. Very nerd cognito. Uh, yeah, it may have been him, it was probably Earl, another friend of ours, that coined the phrase, hide the books, when we would be playing D&D, &D, uh, and the door uh, bell went off or someone knocked, uh, Ben or Earl would yell, hide the books, so that they wouldn't be caught doing something so nerdy. Um, anyway, uh, because of that, that, this is a perfect Ben story, um, I was writing Mistborn, I believe it was, and um, saying to, to friends, hey, does anyone want a cameo in this book? Uh, and um, Micah, it, it was Miss Warren, because Micah uh, said, yeah, put me in, and I got to get a girl. Doesn't matter if I get the girl, I just got to get somebody. <laughs> um, and he became Captain Demo, right? Uh, ben, Dan Wells got tuckerized in that book as well, uh, who miraculously survives being murdered multiple times in the series. Uh, ben, at the same time, yelled out, Do not put me in your book, Sanderson! Uh, because, you know, that would be too nerdy. Uh, and so, um, I started spelling Ben's name wrong. The first time it happened, I did it on accident. Because he, he is O-L-S-E-N, and I am Sander S-O-N, Sanderson. And he is Sen, both. But, so I wrote him Ol Sun, and he was mad because that's like Olsen twins or something like that. You got my name wrong. And so the next time I'm like, wow, we'll just see about that. And I started spelling his name wrong on purpose. And I started trying to find new and interesting ways to spell Ben's name wrong. Uh, one time I think he's Ben Olesun, uh, which is how you would spell his name if you were a chondra. Uh, and uh, other times I put little things in quotes in the middle of his name, you know. Ben, don't put me in your books, Olson, stuff like that. Uh, so that's the second one that started. Um, and then Isaac, I can't remember how Isaac started, honestly. I think it was just that I wanted to see um, if Peter would catch if I made a very subtle tweak to uh, some sort of font or something, because Peter is just like hyper vigilant about fonts. Uh, and indeed he did catch it where I changed the T in Isaac's name to something weird. But I'm like, I'll leave it. That'll be fun. And then that just became its own thing where I started to add weirder and weirder things and characters into Isaac's name. Uh, we often have problems with uh, foreign publishers thinking these are typos and changing them and things like that. So uh, uh, I know what you can do for Kathy. Yeah. Uh, just a blank space in between quotations. Uh, and never name her. And never name her. She would love that. Yeah, it's just, so I'm, sure, I'm sure that she would love that, particularly in the new book that is dedicated to her. <laughs> and I'm sure that's what she would enjoy. Is uh, I know I would enjoy it. You, you would enjoy, uh, so... Yeah. And um, Micah, is he a photographer? Do you have a... He is. A, okay. One of my, think... my early author photos were done by Micah. Uh, Micah DeMo. Well, and I think you have something that he photographed in Yellowstone or something. Oh, yeah. I've got several house. of his yeah. uh, pieces of art hanging in I my I just recognized the name, and I was like, that, that, it, back when I first met you mm -hmm. and first started coming here, I was like, there's no way that's a coincidence. Yeah. So I'm glad. Yeah, I so, was uh, Micah's lovely assistant oh. for many uh, photography trip. I, I think I've told this story before, but... One of the reasons that the Stormlight Archive has the interesting um, visuals that it does is because uh, after I met Micah and he was a photographer, photography major, um, he would take photography trips down to Southern Utah because Southern Utah is gorgeous and great for photography. And he would need a lovely assistant to help him carry camera bags and things. And he persuaded me that I should go with him and experience all the beauty that Southern Utah has to offer. He's from Utah originally. And so I started going with him on these trips. And 
hike slot canyons and saw beautiful vistas and all of these things and inspired the look of the Stormlight Archive, uh, the chasms in particular. A uh, little Wild Horse Canyon is one of the inspirations for that, but the Zion Narrows as well. And this is all due to Micah uh, forcing me to leave my cozy little room where I like to sit and tell stories and for focusing me, forcing me to experience a world to write stories about. So. Thanks to Micah. If any of you guys know Micah, I haven't seen him in years. Um, so, uh, give him, give him my, my thanks and my regard. Uh, just not in the Lannister sense. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> not, never do anything in a Lannister sense. Well, there are certain things that perhaps... Uh, run an army? Yeah, <laughs> run an army. Yeah. Anyway, um, Todd says, you've mentioned that Rhythm of War has a sequence that you've had in your... Uh, head yep. uh, for a long time. Any other scenes without spoilers from Stormlight Archive that you were excited to have in the story? In this one? Oh, in, in the story. Well, there is a scene in book two that is one of these other foundational scenes, but I can't say it without giving spoilers about book two. Uh, it happens near the end of book two. There's another one. There's a lot of them. So the thing is, most of these are going to be in Stormlight um, because Stormlight Archive is the book I started planning and then had in my head uh, the series for like 10 years without being able to write it, right? Mistborn, I designed, uh, outlined, and then wrote. And I'm really excited by how Mistborn turned out, but the original Mistborn, they don't have any scenes that I was planning for a decade because I basically came up with the story and executed it. Though I had done uh, the, the magic system in a previous book, Mistborn Prime, that will someday release. Um, so a lot of these are in Stormlight. They're sprinkled all across Stormlight. Uh, there's, a, there's one in Book 5, there's one in Book 10, there's one in Book 8. Um, and these are just things when I originally conceived the Stormlight Archive uh, that I was really excited to get to and now have had to wait 20 years to write these scenes. And so uh, it's very fulfilling to finally be able to write some of these things because, you know, I wrote Stor uh, Way of Kings Prime and then had to stop and not write Stormlight for seven years. And so it built in my head with all of these things that I wanted to do. There are some really cool scenes uh, for uh, era, th era 3 of, uh, uh, of Mistborn that I've been waiting now, probably for over a decade at this point, uh, to be able to share with you. So once I yield it to that, then that'll be really exciting. But there aren't any from Wax and Wayne because I conceived and executed Wax and Wayne, right? Um, I thought of it and then wrote it, um, rather than having these year-long, um, their decade-long waits to finally get the story written, so. When we do our spoiler stream, probably next month, you'll be able to ask that question again, and I can go into spoilerific details about what the, the scene from book two that was one of those scenes. Okay, so I was just looking for a decent question. I was uh, listening to you too much. Oh. Okay, so House of Wonder says, uh, when working on a magic system um, that has, but there are elements that just don't fit, what would you do to make it work? So, a couple of things. Um, there are lots of different places you can go with this. One is to cut out the pieces of the magic system that don't fit and design a new magic system around them and fit them in better into another story later on. I have done this numerous times where something just does not fit. Um, that is just better cutting them out. However, you can make a lot of different things fit uh, together if you have an appropriate theme. Uh, for instance, um, Hemalurgy, Ferrochemy, and Allomancy were designed separately. Uh, Mistborn and uh, a book I wrote called The Final Empire. One of them had Allomancy, one of them had Ferrochemy. Different worlds entirely. Hemalurgy was designed when I was building the outline for the Mistborn series. Um, but what that meant is that when I sat down to write it, I'm like, I want to have some sort of cohesive theme between Allomancy and Ferrochemy. What is that theme going to be? And I just... Uh, Ferrochemy had not originally been uh, forced to use metals, and I just added that rule. You store your attributes in different types of metal, and I themed those metals similar to what the powers in, uh, in Allomancy did. 
Uh, Allomancy even was built the same sort of way where I designed the powers to fit what a thieving crew could do, what they would need, um, and what an assassin, really the original version is what an assassin would want, powers that would help an assassin. And then when I wrote Mistborn, not Mistborn Prime, I redesigned it to fit a thieving crew. Um, those powers then could feel like a grab bag of just random things, but kind of making them have this, the theme of they each use a different metal and stuff like this connects them thematically in the reader's head to the point that it doesn't feel like a grab bag of powers. Uh, it feels like it works. And of course, I also did this work to be like, all right, can I fit them into groupings? So human beings love to group things. This is what we do, right? Uh, and none of these groupings are, like, if you look at the animal, the, the, the families and the phylums and all of these things, this is something external we put upon uh, the world around us. It's not necessary, there are no natural breakpoints between these things, and in fact, we do some pretty weird things, right? Like, uh, Magellan, the macaw, is, like, closer related to a lizard than, like, um, what is it, is it a turtle? is one of, the, one of the families is over on the other side of, of birds, between most of the reptiles. Um, it might be the crocodilians, but we say birds are something different, even though they're closer related to the reptiles than these other things that we have grouped with the reptiles. It just feels right for us to group them together. And you can go a, right a long way on a magic system on things that are grouped together that feel right. Uh, with Allomancy, I'm like, all right, can I make pushing and pulling metals? Can I make uh, a force and an opposite for each of these powers? It helps make them feel like they fit into a periodic table, which is one of the other things that I wanted to do, because we have grouped like elements in a periodic table. And indeed, naturally in nature, some things fall into these groupings pretty naturally in ways that we can, we can notice, like the noble gases, right? Hey, we, these things have share some attributes. Uh, the things in this line explode when they're exposed to water. That's interesting. Um, so making your magic system's abilities play into this sort of thing is one way that you can do it. But, like, I wouldn't stress this too much. Like, we accept X-Men, right? Um, and X-Men is just like their magic system. It's like, woo, whatever, whatever goes. You over here, you're growing wings like an angel for some reason, while you over here have power over fire. What does that mean? You shoot fire. Um, you know what? That's just a rule of cool. We're going to have this thing and we're going to make it all kind of connect together by saying they're all mutants, which becomes a cool story attribute. And that's the thematic thing that connects them is the way that the society regards them rather than the what the powers actually are because the powers don't group naturally very well because it's whatever the writer was thinking of at the moment when they de designed that character. So uh, lots of different things you can do here and the way that the characters in the book respond to things is often going to be what the reader uses as their guide. So if the characters in the book are like, here I can explain this in you know three easy rules, then the readers can be like, oh that's really easy. Even if those rules are kind of uh, kind of interesting, shall we say. Uh, the last piece of advice I would give you here is if there are big irregularities in your uh, magic system and they are going to be a plot point, then hanging a lantern on it and having the character say, this one doesn't make sense. We're not shy, sure why it works like this. You can get also a lot of mileage out of that by just saying, hey, science doesn't make sense sometimes. Well, it will make sense if we can figure it out. but. Special and um, general relativity do not have a unifying theory yet. That's weird. Why not? We're not sure yet. Eventually we will uh, understand, but for now, we just have to say, it's weird, we're not sure why it acts like this, but it does, and it's repeatable, so therefore it is a law of nature um, as we understand it now. So, yeah, there you go. Long... Uh, rambling answer to that question as well. I'm very good at those. Um, an interesting question from the chat uh, from Cassian. Uh, Cassian, not sure uh, if yep. I'm pronouncing that right. Says, is the in-world The Way of Kings meant to be the exact opposite of The Prince by Machiavelli? 
Uh, no. Uh, that is because if you read The Prince by Machiavelli, it's not actually, it uh, doesn't deserve quite the reputation it has. But it is meant to be an opposite uh, in many ways to the ends justify the means philosophy that we kind of cliff notes put upon the prince. Mm. Um, prince is, it's got a lot more depth to that uh, discussion than uh, at least I thought before I read the prince. Um, but it is supposed to be a counterpoint to that idea, the ends justify means. A counterpoint to that concept is what if the means are the point, then the end will not justify them because the means are more important in many ways than the point. So it is yes, but it's also no. Um, from the chat, Alex says, my question is, how did you plan your writing time when you were not a professional writer? So, I cheated. So, you need to ask other writers about this. I cheated because I got a job working a graveyard shift at a hotel in which I was able to write six hours a night every day uh, while I was going to school full time. Um, and this was a big life hack on my, uh, on my part uh, because I don't think I could have written the amount that I did with any other job, right? Uh, the fact that of an eight-hour shift of work, I only had two hours of actual work, and then I had six hours where I was required to be there on call if something went wrong. But it's Provo, Utah, and Provo, Utah, after 10 o'clock, is like dead, right? Um, and so, you know, once in a while, someone would need some, some towels or something weird would happen and people get locked out of their room or something like that. So yeah, I did have interruptions, but for the most part, day in and day out, six hours of writing time that uh, I could do that and homework um, during that time. So really, it was probably a little less than that of writing time, but I arranged my college career such that um, my writing time was a lot of my homework, and uh, I was, by that point, very focused on becoming a writer, and everything else was in the service of that. Uh, and so I tried to arrange my homework so it was in service of the writing that I was trying to do. And if I was studying something in school that I had to do a lot of reading for, I'd be like, all right, I'm going to use this reading as research for a book. How can I use this reading? to be something that ends up in a book. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, that's why I say you should talk to someone else who had to have a real job. Um, I was unmarried at the time. I did not have any children. I uh, basically was going to school and writing books. And I spent years doing that. I think when I actually added it up, it's less time than I imagine it being. Because uh, I imagine it was like 10 years, but it was really only like six, I think. It was from 98 until um, early 2000s, 2003. So it's only like five years, right? Um, five and a half years, maybe. Uh, but that was a very important time in my life for writing books. Uh, talk to Dan Wells. Dan made a career out of writing while he worked a real job and had a family, because he got married much younger than I did. Uh, and um, for him, uh, if I can to give the Cliff Notes version, though, you should talk to Dan about it, he would make a point of writing sometime before he got home from work, either writing before he got up from work or spending his lunch hour writing, because he found that once he got home from work, he was exhausted, and then kids exhausted him further. And so writing in the evening after kids went to bed was very difficult for him. All right, great, thanks Adam. Um, so, that is done. How many more books do we need to get? Oh, no Kara yet. When Kara is around, we'll ask her that. Oh, Kara, uh, how many more books do we need to get through? How much do you want me to do that versus these things, is I guess the question. Because uh, we have 40 minutes left. I would rather you do these than those. Okay, but, great. I mean, we still need to get through those, but yes. I have a longer time well, period on that. Well, we can, uh, all right. Because we'll be back in two weeks signing again. So. Uh, that'll be Thanksgiving Day. Oh, we will not be back in two weeks. We'll be back in three weeks. Yeah. Okay. Definitely not Thanksgiving Day. 
Why not? Well, I would be all for it, uh, probably. Uh, so here's a weird thing. I'll set up the cameras for you. Yeah. Um, holidays. Um, I'm fine with them. I really like holidays. Um, they, it's really nice to get together with family and things. But there's a part of me that gets annoyed by holidays because I have to stop doing uh, my stories. And this was my, a worse thing earlier in my life before I was married and things. Uh, when my friends assumed that having a day off was a really great thing. Whereas if there were like a day off from work, I wanted to catch up on my stories because getting the writing done... It was, even with those six hours a day, sometimes it was hard to get the time I wanted to tell stories. And so, like, Saturdays would happen, they're like, come play with us, Brandon. I'm like, no, I finally got a full day off. I'm going to work on this story that's, that's, something's wrong with it. So, uh, historically, I have enjoyed using vacation time to get ahead on stories. But these days, I have uh, kind of uh, firewalled my family uh, uh, experiences and it, I've talked about before where it's like there are times that I must spend with my family and that's very useful to get in that mindset so that the hey you could be writing you could be working this doesn't creep in and I actually give my full dedication uh, and heart to my family during family times and so I wouldn't actually want to do a live stream on uh, on Thanksgiving Thanksgiving is a great holiday uh, but there are some other uh, days when other people assume I want to take a day off when actually I really want to catch up on this thing that I'm behind on or things like that. But if we did that, I would have to make everybody else work, and I'm not, I'm not that kind of boss. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Matthew is looking for, and I'm simplifying this, tips for avoiding info dumps. Okay, tips for avoiding info dumps. I do watch the lectures. Uh, they'll go into this, but a few tips. So, if you're having a real problem with info dumps, one of the things you can do is you can embrace info dumps and you can try writing a really interesting first person perspective that's got a cool, unique voice that makes the info dumps fun to read about. Uh, if you want some examples of this, Lemony Snicket is a perfect example. Um, because Lemony Snicket's voice is so entertaining, the info dumps become selling points because you know he's going to be saying silly things about this info dump, and it becomes some of the best parts of the book. Uh, also, famously, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? The info dumps in Hitchhiker's Guide are the most fun parts of Hitchhiker's Guide. When they stop to read an encyclopedia entry to you in those books, you know you're in for a good time, and it's going to be one of the highlights of the chapter. And this is because um, if, you can, if you can refine a voice that is that interesting, you can make info dumps a selling point. Um, this is one of the reasons why uh, Robert Jordan can info dump in Matt's viewpoint more easily than he can info dump in uh, Rand or Perrin's viewpoint, because Matt would give you a description of someone that gave you a picture of them, and he would include a witty one-liner about how they, you know, could chew on bars of steel and spit out nails or something like that, right? Or they, that they maybe had a bear in their family lineage somewhere. And uh, this just makes things that would normally be dull, be really interesting. But other ways you can do this is you can make sure to theme your info dumps toward the character. That's kind of what Robert Jordan was doing, but also if, you know, you're going to have to describe the way that this uh, religion works. Well, having it described through the eyes of someone who sees the world in a very interesting way uh, is going to flavor and season that info dump to the point that it doesn't feel like an info dump, and it's really, really interesting. Uh, the other tip is, generally you need fewer of them than you think you need. Generally, your reader is going to be better at picking up on these things than you assume that they will be, and indeed, you can then uh, leave more out, check with your alpha and beta readers and see if they're getting confused, let them pick up on more things via context, let more things come out during arguments or discussions that are just little lines here and there. Break them up rather than doing them all at once. This is one of the big uh, technological revolutions, quote unquote, we've had in fantasy since Grandpa Tolkien's days, uh, where back in those days, you, and this, you see this a lot in the late 70s, early 80s fantasy also, they're like, well, we need to get across the creation story of this world. 
It's going to be in the prologue, and it's going to be a long five-page explanation of the creation story. And then they got a little more interesting and a little more, uh, a little more variety to them as people were exploring the genre and how to do an epic fantasy uh, in a way that, that conveys information in an exciting way. And then you start to hit like the Robert Jordan era where it's like, instead of a big info dump at the beginning uh, to explain the lore, we're going to take a snapshot from a moment in history that was really powerful and interesting, and we're going to let you put the pieces together through the course of the book of what the context of that scene was. And that just works better. It's more interesting. It's more evocative. It's not that Tolkien did a bad job or the people who came after him. It's that they are the pioneers in the genre. And it's like saying they did a bad job is like saying that the early photographers did, did a much worse job because there were no colors in their, uh, the pictures they were taking, right? Um, but it does let us build upon the shoulders of giants, so to speak, and see what works and what doesn't work. And um, those are some, there's some tips. Um, that voice in the back of your head says, mm -hmm. did you ever consider using a pen name? If so, why didn't you? Oh, great question. Yes, I did. Um, so, pen names are very romantic. Um, I mean, the fact that they have a cool name like that, pen name, uh, just romanticizes it by itself. And plus, if you have a name that you have lived with all your life, you probably, most of us, are going to think, that's a pretty dull name, right? It's just a very common first name and a not-so-distinctive last name. And so you'd be like, I want to, you know, put a cool, uh, a cool spoiler on the back of my name, and I want to put some bells and whistles on it and have a pen name. And um, when I was first starting out, I, I pointed out to my editor, I'm like, my dad's name is Wynn. Uh, W-I-N-N, and my middle name is Wynn. And that's really distinctive. Uh, a Google for Wynn Sanderson is going to bring up far fewer results than a Google for Brandon Sanderson. Uh, and my editor talked me out of it. Uh, my editor said a couple of things. He said, uh, number one, if you have a pen name, then um, people will start calling you by that, and they won't really know you know, you'll have this, this dual life, which for some people, I think is a selling point. He thought it was not a selling point. He thought you would want to be the same person at cons that you are. And indeed, I, turns out, the way that I work is I'm very open with my fans. Um, I do live streams. I, I talk a lot about the process of my books. Uh, I have released first drafts of my books on the internet. I'm very open with myself, my life, and my process. And so for that reason, he was right for me. But I do think the keep a separate life is, um, is useful. Like, I believe um, Orson Scott Card, I think it was him who said, it could have been someone else, but he said uh, it was nice, maybe it was Dave. Um, one of them said that they, they always knew what, how to respond to someone by what they call him, because Orson Scott Card goes by Scott, right? So if someone called him Scott, if he heard that name, then he's automatically in, oh, this is somebody who knows me mode. And if someone calls him Orson, then he's like, oh, this is, I'm now in author performance mode, because this is the person who knows me as an author. Uh, I could be misquoting Scott on that. It might have been another author who said something along those lines. So that's a valid use. But uh, another valid, another thing people do use pen names for that I would call one of the best reasons to is to um, obfuscate your name um, from your pen name for professional reasons. For instance, let's say that you are a widely respected academic who writes about uh, immune, Im immunology, and you want to go write dinosaur erotica. At that point, it's probably a good idea that people who are trying to find your dinosaur erotica can Google your name and get that, and the people who are trying to look to see if they should invite you to a conference do not Google your name and get your fiction. They get your academic papers. Um, that's an extreme example, but it is kind of illustrating the point of why sometimes people use pen names. Uh, similar to this, but not necessarily as, uh, as evocative a story, is some people say if you want to use... Um, 
If you want to write in a lot of disparate genres, then you should have a pen name. The argument for this, and I made this argument to my editor, um, so I'll, I'll share it with you. The argument goes that um, a lot of times, the way that buying and selling books works, particularly in bookstores, is that they will order the same number of copies of your book, of your next book, as they sold of the previous one. And the argument that Dave made, which is why Dave Farland uh, and Dave Wolverton are the same person, why he has a pen name, he says, when I was deciding to write my epic fantasy series, science fiction was starting to underperform in the market from where it had been for a while, and fantasy was outselling it. And I didn't want the people to go look and see what of David Farland book sells and order that number of copies. I wanted them to listen to the sales force about what a Dave Wolverton book is going to sell and have them order that number of copies based on it being a lead fantasy title from Tor. And I said this to my agent, he's like, or to my editor, he's like, if that happens, that happens. You don't need to prepare for that right now. Just use your name, Brandon. Um, he also said, there's already a win who writes books. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, Diana Wynne Jones. Uh, she's got the win. And so he, he persuaded me more along the idea of that there was really no reason for it. Uh, in his opinion, and that I would enjoy just being Brandon Sanderson. Um, and he was right for, 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 for me. That whole writing in different genres thing is a much smaller deal now. In fact, having your titles show up, um, if you're writing something different in the ebook browsing, is way more valuable than the cost you might have where they order fewer copies because of whatever. Um, and so generally, right now, unless you don't want your audiences to know about the other books you're writing, um, then that reason is generally suggested not to use uh, two different names. But that's not going toward using a pen name instead of your real name. And in that case, it's just really up to you, like flavoring of it and uh, whether you think it would be nice to segregate your private life from your writing life. Um, a lot of people who use pen names do it because they, <coughs> um, for the Dave reason, right? I believe you could ask um, Robin Hobb, um, whose, uh, whose real name is Megan Lindholm, but I think Robin's like her middle name or her grandma's name or something like that. Uh, there's, there was established reason why she picked that and uh, it worked for her. But you could ask her, um, I believe that she had been writing under Megan Lindholm for a while and she was writing now a first-person story from a young man's viewpoint, and she want, didn't want the reader to know uh, the gender of the author, to make assumptions about that, and to also make assumptions about what her previous books had been like when they read Assassin's Apprentice. Um, but I could be misquoting uh, Robin Hobb on that one, so you'd really want to talk to her. Uh, she uh, has obviously made very good use of a pen name. Um, so, so there you go. Uh, from the chat, Wynn Sanderson says, yes, thank you for not tarnishing my name. Oh, wow. <laughs> is there actually, is this really, I or is that my dad? Oh, it is your dad. It I is my you. dad? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> I, I didn't think I'd ever met another Wynn Sanderson. I don't know why. My dad. He, so I think he maybe created an account just to watch you. I don't well, know. I uh, checked to make sure it was him before I said anything. Yes, uh, you all, uh, my father will sign your books. I will, I'll warn you, um, if you're in, anywhere in his vicinity with one of my books, um, my father does, loves to do things like, um, I once went to a book signing, and it was about, by the time I was gathering fairly large crowds, uh, this was in Dayton, Ohio, Books and Company, and uh, I started doing my speech, and I did my, actually I finished my speech, and I was starting to uh, organize people to get in line, and there was a big disturbance at the back of the crowd. And I'm like, what is going on back there? Everyone's turning away from me. And my dad had arrived and started signing books. Um, and I didn't know, like, he was, he must have, you were when that, where, I think you were in Minneapolis or something like that at that point. So it was quite a drive. Um, but he showed up, maybe you were in Amherst, um, and just started signing my books, and suddenly my father was there, and it was such a novel thing that, um, that a lot of people went and got books signed by the actual Wynn Sanderson, who you all should be thankful to, because as I put 
in the dedication uh, to whichever book it was it's his. I think it's maybe Mistborn 2, uh, Mistborn 3, something like that. Um, my father bought me quite a number of books when I was a kid uh, and fueled my, my reading addiction that became a writing addiction. Uh, he bought me my very first Anne McCaffrey novel, uh, which after I'd read it in the library and I had to have it, he, uh, he went and bought, bought it for me. So, there you are. Um, JT says, as a new writer, the line between Third Limited and Omniscient is really unclear to me. How do you portray Kaladin's thoughts without breaking perspective, and where do you draw the line between these? Uh, great. So, there are, there is some um, bit of a continuum between the two. Like, uh, there are things that some people will do, and it still kind of counts as limited, even though it's inching toward omniscient. One of the examples is uh, Robert Jordan's wind scene from the beginning of Wheel of Time. Every one of those early, he does like two or three paragraphs, sometimes one paragraph of the wind scene, that's in omniscient. And then the wind zips around and zooms and settles on a person, and it settles in the limited, and that's the only omniscient in the, in the entire book. Um, we still count that as a third limited book, even though it's using this kind of flourish for omniscient for a little bit. So the way to practice doing limited is to get um, kind of the bread and butter of limited is to stop describing how people are feeling and start describing how they look to the character. So instead of saying, uh, Adam was, dis was distracted, um, I say, Adam picked up his phone and looked at a text that he'd just gotten, right? Um, because I can't actually know if Adam's distracted. Uh, he's pretty good at paying attention when he's that. Or you say, Adam seemed distracted. You start using the word seemed or looked like. The problem is, those things just add words. And so, in some cases, it leads to inelegant writing, which is why you kind of err on describing what they're doing. Um, but instead of a door closing, you hear a door close, right? Um, if, if you're in the character's head and they're faced away from the door. You describe things, uh, you get very much, um, get a lot of practice, like the thing that makes Third Limited so great and why we like it, why it's a, uh, a very useful tool, is it lets the reader really get inside that character's head and start seeing the world through their eyes. And if you aren't using one of the strengths of Third Limited, which is describing the world through the eyes of the character, then um, you are certainly not playing to, to, you know, you're not taking advantage of the format. You might as well be an omniscient because it has different advantages, right? Um, now, the biggest bend that most people who write Third Limited will do is they accept that the narrative is sometimes going to use language different from the character's voice. And most readers accept this. So, for instance, when I, I'm writing from Lyft's viewpoint, I don't put all of the narrative into her voice. I usually have a few lines of description, which are really in her kind of dialect and, uh, and narrative, but a lot of it settles in kind of a natural Brandon Sanderson's narrative voice, uh, which is technically a bit of a more omniscient thing. If you were really hardcore on your third limited, then if you were in a character's uh, head who had a strange dialect, then all of it would be in dialect. Every, every description, every little piece. Most of us bend away from that um, and use, um, use direct thoughts, right? Uh, if you really want to put something in someone's viewpoint and uh, um, our voice, I mean, even if you're kind of in, you're in third limited, but you're kind of allowing yourself to make the narrative have a bit more of a structured voice, then you write the italicized direct thoughts where they think of themselves in the first person or things like that. Um, but just practice understanding that when you're in third limited, you want to not describe anything as certain that the character doesn't know. Or if they do know it, say how they know it. Say, you know, if someone's spouse is distracted and you know they always get distracted when they do this, then you can rely upon that knowledge as a, as a character um, and things like that. Make sure you've got, you're using the advantages by putting it into the character's voice now and then and inching toward it, kind of have a hybrid between your natural voice and the character's voice in narrative, and then go full into their voice in their direct thoughts and in their dialogue. Um, and use this tool. You may find that you prefer an omniscient, and that's okay. 
you can still do omniscient. Books still get published in omniscient. Uh, you just have to understand why you're using omniscient and what the strength of omniscient is and play to those strengths. The, in my opinion, greatest uh, science fiction book of all time, Dune, is written in omniscient. Um, and it is the gold standard for how to do that. But practice both of them and then settle on the one that works for you. Understand that you can, some people go stretch what the limited means. Um, and as long as you are not showing the direct thoughts of someone who's not the character's viewpoint you're in, you're often going to be okay, uh, even if you push it a little further toward omniscient than I do. Uh, being consistent is the key. Uh, as long as you're consistent, readers usually will fall into what your voice is and your rhythm, and they will accept it. Um, it's if you're inconsistent, then they're like, this feels like a viewpoint error. Whose head am I in? This is, I'm, I'm lost, that sort of thing. How hard would you judge me knowing mm -hmm. I've never read Dune? Mm. I own it. Yeah. I just, uh, it's I just, haven't read it. It's too bad. I wouldn't judge you, though. There's too many good books uh, in the, the world problem. to read, right? Like, you should never judge anyone for not having experienced a great piece of media because there are more great pieces of media than any of us can consume in a lifetime. That's a great uh, answer. Thank you. So I don't feel judged for you. Mm -hmm. So, Josh says, what advice do you have for a perfectionist who was never satisfied with what they write and subsequently becomes demotivated? Oh, man. This is rough. This is really rough. Um, and so... The thing that helped me the most is understanding that the product of my writing time is me rather than the book, right? I am becoming a better writer for having written the book, and the book is a snapshot of my skill at that point in my life, and my goal is to be getting better and to be achieving closer and closer to that perfect story, and it's okay to release snapshots of who you are before you reach that. Um, and that, that sort of mindset is very liberating for me. I don't know if it will be for you, uh, but I would recommend trying to think that way. Um, think of yourself as working toward that goal of perfection. And in the meantime, you're going to let everybody see your journey. You're going to sell and publish the books. And yeah, they're not perfect yet. You're not perfect yet. You're going to get there someday. But in the meantime, it's a, a great experience for people to be able to uh, experience your stories on your path to being able to get there. Um, no work is ever done, it's only abandoned. This is true. Um, but at the same time, each work is just a picture of who you are at the moment, and that's okay. Um, some things that, that, uh, that help people um, is sometimes having a, um, a cheerleader, right? Like, we talk about writing groups and making sure that the writing groups are giving you solid feedback and criticism, but it's also okay to have somebody who's in your corner who really likes your, your storytelling and really likes you, and whose job is to tell you, no, this doesn't suck. This is actually really good, and this is what I liked about it. Um, and that often is a spouse or a family member or someone like that, um, or, or a good friend, but there are people that it's okay in your life to say to them, I don't need criticism from you. I just need to know if this is worth continuing. Um, when they figure out that they get to be your cheerleader, a lot of times those people can be some of the, the best motivators in your life. Um, and, boy, perfectionism is hard. Like, the, it is bigger usually for, uh, if you're having this problem, than just your stories, right? Uh, being okay with yourself being a flawed version of the person you eventually want to become is a really important lesson to learn. Um, and understanding that a piece of art does not have to be um, mechanically perfect to be artistically perfect. This is a philosophy of mine. Um, I feel that great works of art can be perfect even in their imperfections. I don't think that the Mona Lisa, or, you know, let's point at the, uh, the Sistine Chapel, which was truly awe-inspiring when I saw it, would be better if that one little brushstroke that I'm sure is there somewhere that, uh, that Michelangelo hated that he got wrong had been fixed. It is now a part of the piece, and the piece is the piece of perfect art that evokes a feeling 
and an emotion and a power that is beyond the actual brush strokes um, and the mechanical pieces that put it together. Uh, you cannot make that more perfect, even if you fix some minor errors in the mechanical put together of it. And I personally have started to dislike the term of, it's not a perfect movie, or things like that, because that sort of terminology just doesn't seem to, to fit um, with, with artistic representations. If it is um, the best that you can do at the moment with your artistic skill, and it has helped you learn to be a better storyteller, that is the perfect story for you right now, and it's okay to package that and release it, even with some mechanical flaws that if you had more experience you would fix, because that's how art is created. Um, I hope that helps. Also, the chat has come up with uh, a pending for you. Oh, dear. Oh. Okay. It's not bad. Oh, yeah? Uh, Brandon Inkblessed. <laughs> Brandon Inkblessed. I, I do like that. That's not bad. Uh, uh, most people, I think, prefer Branderson or uh, Brando Sando. Is that the one oh, that they Brando use? Brando Sando Fando. Yeah. That's your, yep. your people. That's Look what, what I'm signing, everyone. Woo! <laughs> I could go read it right now. Oh, I bet you just want to do uh, that yes. so bad. Uh huh. <laughs> it is nice to, the, like, the, um, uh, the, seeing the art in it, um, after seeing them on the screen, and Isaac putting them together and things, it's just so great. Um, he didn't do the, uh, the, the end pages, but he art directed them, and, uh, we have some really, really talented artists that we've been hoping to work with for a while, who uh, agreed to do some uh, some artwork for us because um, you know we have Carla's in the back here and these are just yeah so great. <laughs> they're really awesome so and they're kind of just for me because they're the paintings of the heralds which are characters that I know and have been uh, telling stories in my head about for 20 years but you don't know them very well. You know Nail a little bit, but most of the Heralds, you're like, who are these people? Why do you have these awesome pic pictures of people that aren't in the books? Well, that's because they will be in the books, and they are the people that I wanted paintings of. Right. Selfish. <laughs> okay, so Tyler says, do you have any suggestions about indicating development inside a secondary character uh, when you are writing from a different viewpoint character? Yeah. Um, so, couple things. Uh, remember contrast. Uh, contrast is one, going to make things stand out in people's brains. It's just like colors, right? Uh, two colors that are too similar uh, often are going to blend together. And so if you can contrast that character against another character at several points in the story, where maybe early on they would make very different decisions, but later on, they, uh, the character has changed to agree with something that the other character says. That moment of contrast will really highlight um, a, some character growth or change to your readers. And so watch for chances to do things like that. Um, and of course, the, the old standby is the viewpoint character, what they're interested in and paying attention to, the reader will be interested in pay attention to. And so if the viewpoint character says something like, um, can, you can highlight it with them. For instance, you know, say a character has started dressing differently, like they dress up now. Um, and the viewpoint character is a little oblivious, like maybe the reader might be. And you've, through the course of this book, shown that this other character has taken an interest in style and now are dressing really stylishly. Um, you could have your viewpoint character be like, yeah, he's such a slob, and have a few other characters that are there be like, no, look, he's really sharp. You could learn a thing or two from him. And have the char main character look, or the viewpoint character look at him and be like, oh, wait, how long has they, have they been doing this? Wow, people are paying attention to them now. Uh, how did I miss this? And those subtle things that you put in can be really fun for the character, the readers who miss it to go back through and see this character's subtle transformation through the course of the story. Uh, it can be just really fun for rereads to be able to see things like that happening. So. Oh yeah, I do see that now, Adam. I had not seen it 
uh, before. I did see you writing it. Yeah, no so, worries. He's I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah, uh, it's it's actually it's really good. He's written down a thing to remind me to show you guys the Kickstarter stuff that I promised earlier. So I am glad that he did that. Ooh, we're gonna have some Warbreaker. So those of you who want a signed copy of Warbreaker, we are signing them, and we have persuaded Tor to put the. Uh, the foiling back on the covers of these. Uh, for a little while, they were not foiling the covers um, of Warbreaker. Um, and we, uh, we shamed them into spending the extra 25 cents or whatever it is to put the foil back on the, the hard covers. Uh, and during the stream today, I've seen a lot of questions about how the uh, Rhythm of War release party will work. Unfortunately, um, if you we're yeah. not one of the the lucky few thousand who were able to buy uh, one of the books through the tours uh, through tours partner book program. Um, you're not going to be able to watch it, but I will be posting it later. Yeah. Um, and so this is a mistake on our part. Um, we have never done this before, and in hindsight, what we should have done is we should have had a way for anyone to be part of the. Um, the uh, release event. We realized this after the fact. We even went to Tor and were like, uh, we think we should change this and find a way that other people can be part of this. And uh, what Tor's publicist said, which was right, which was, uh, is painful to hear, they said, you have already let the bookstores use this as promotion to sell the books as an exclusive event. Uh, if you now take that away from the bookstores, um, it is going to be, this is just one of those things that's probably a bad idea to double back on um, after you've let them make it a selling point. Um, and indeed, uh, that is what we decided we had to do. If we ever do a full-blown digital release party like this again, most likely what we'll do is we'll do a local release party that then has, is also digital at the same time. Um, if we do that again, we will have a way that people can participate in it, even if they didn't end up getting one of the books from one of the, uh, one of the bookstores. But one of the things you have to keep in mind is bookstores are having a rough time right now, and they're all kind of really worried about, um, about staying open, right? Uh, the, the coronavirus hit them a lot. A lot of people moved digital who were buying uh, physical books, and then they found out that I was canceling my tour, which is usually a thing that brings them a lot of income right around the holidays when they need it to finally kind of balance their books and things like that. And lo and behold, they were no longer going to get uh, a tour. And uh, for a lot of the sci-fi fantasy bookstores, uh, I would have been one of the biggest uh, events that they would do, right? Like, um, and so uh, that was really uh, disappointing to them. And so that's why we said here, they were really worried they wouldn't be able to sell any books. And so letting them have this be exclusive, it also lets us kind of do a, uh, a test whether we can manage uh, all to make it work. Um, so if we do it again, we will not make it this exclusive. We will make a way that anyone, uh, particularly people, from overseas, uh, you know, who are like, yeah, I, I couldn't buy one of those books because I need the book in Spanish, Brandon. Um, which is totally a great argument. We understand all those arguments and we feel bad and we will not do it this way again. But we felt we had to stick to our word uh, on this event. So, Adam will be posting it after. Yes, yeah, a uh, few weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly how sure. I'll talk with... Uh with Taurus publicity team yeah. and see if they have a, a preference, but mm -hmm. you will be able to see it eventually. But we did record some content for everyone, yes. which I will be posting to Brandon's YouTube channel on release day. So uh, we're going to have little things, or not even little things, some of them are quite long, but um, you will be able to be involved yeah. some way, just not necessarily for the... Forgive the, us as we figure yes. out how to do this better, because honestly, I think... Unless, unless something drastic changes, I don't think that I'm going to be doing big tours anymore. Um, they're just so exhausting. And we are having to move to the, uh, to the point that we were not, I was not going to be personalizing people's books anyway, right? 
Like if you've been following what I was talking about before coronavirus, we were going to be starting to limit this tour would have been 100 people getting their books personalized out of usually crowds of seven or 800, depending on the bookstore. Um, and already I was only be able to reach, you know, and actually meet one out of seven of you. And so what's probably going to happen is we're probably going to move to, we have a big release event that's in person at a convention center, uh, either here. Uh, we have done the release event other places sometimes, so it's possible that we would go back to doing that. Um, like, I did a release for one of the Wax and Wayne books in the UK. Um, so, we will have one big in-person release event, uh, and at that I will do personalizations. I don't know how many, but I'll do at least some. And then we will sell signed books through a lot of different local bookstores, and then we will let people in on the big release event um, in some way or another. So, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, before I forget again, Let's talk about these things. So, <clears throat> so we just got we got some of these um, some of these things in. Uh, one is uh, this tickles me. I know this is the weirdest thing, but we got our chicken scout patch, um, our shard blade proficiency chicken scout uh, scout patch. Um, so, can you see that on, on the thing? And it actually. You can see it better on the, um, on the uh, Chasm Fiend Wrangling, or the Great Shell Wrangling badge. The detail on these is really great. Isaac showed these to me for the first time today, and I'd been worried that Ben's uh, cool little drawings wouldn't translate, but they actually do, and they are embossed. They're not just printed, they're, uh, they're stitched. Um, and so they use like a hybrid method to get the little details on, um, and... Uh, we really are pleased with how these turned out. Again, this is a goofy thing that is this string's fault, so I, I'm sure the stream will enjoy it. Uh, but everyone else is going to get, you know, whichever one of these goes in the thing, yeah. uh, they get like 20,000 Kickstarter back. Yeah, you're like, going to be like, what the heck? There's a parrot with a shard blade. Why? We should uh, maybe include a note saying, these direct from Brandon. Yeah, stream. I think that we ought to include some sort of note that this no. is what's in your package yeah. or something. Okay. Uh, but, yeah. I love um, that. We have the backer yeah. pin. Uh, so this is the pin that will, that is only... You tilt it towards oh, the light. Tilt it toward the light. Good idea. Uh, that, that this was from this event that is, um, we're never going to reprint. So, um, oh yeah, that lets me... Ooh, oh yeah, okay. So there we go. You can kind of see it. Uh, it turned out really nice. Uh, just like the, the Kickstarter thing said, it's the double eye of the Almighty, um, and it has dots instead of the symbols, um, and is otherwise from the, the thing in the books. Good job, Adam. I don't know. I can totally see what I'm doing. You're welcome. So, uh, that turned out really well. That guy is ginormous. This is like for a backpack or something, right? It's got double pins on the back. Uh, but, we also got the order pins, um, which are, uh, let's see... I don't know if you'll be able to see these, but there you go. Uh, these are looking really nice. Um, they came in and uh, very pleased with how these guys look. So you will get your pin of your order um, with your Kickstarter thing. Um, and if you didn't get one, then uh, I don't think, I don't know if these will reprint. This guy won't. Uh, we might have these available in a future Kickstarter or something like that. Uh, but those are the things we've gotten in so far. Um, we are still, um, I think that we found out that the deck of cards is going to take the longest. Uh, and the card deck looks great. But it's going to take the longest just because uh, this time of year, uh, the manufacturers of playing cards are quite busy, and we've had all the coronavirus delays and things like that, and so we just had to get in their line. Um, it was either that or use a less um, a less experienced card making company, um, and we trusted the people who collect decks of cards and picked a company that has a great reputation, and so we would rather wait. Uh, so we're not sure when those are going to start arriving. I think these um, have arrived in bulk, right? I believe so. Uh, and so we already have those ready to be shipped out. Uh, but I think the cards are going to take the longest. And the coins um, have all been modeled, uh, have all been approved, and are now being printed. Um, and uh, Don Shard 
uh, has been sent and Don Shard is uh, being printed. Um, and so the books of that, again, we think probably January um, is a good bet, um, but uh, it's going to depend on how long the printing and shipping takes. But uh, we are we actually turn in the last tweaks we can make to that tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Um, and and so. if January is not the date, you know, I'm sure we'll keep you updated. Yeah, we'll keep blog you updated. Post the Kickstarter. Yep. Uh, it's just going to depend on at this point how long it takes to to do the physical manufacturing and shipping to us, um, because those are all in the works. It's just the card deck that we don't actually even know when we're going to be getting that back, but it should be January-ish is our guess, uh, so that we can send all these things out. Uh, the card deck will be worth the wait. Um, I really like uh, how that turned out. I'm going to finish this pile, and then I'm going to do one more... One more table? One more table, so we're going to go a little later than normal tonight because... Congratulations, everyone. Yes, uh, because Kara said she wanted three more tables worth, and I've done two of the three so far, so... Okay. Um, Alex says, how do you frame contradictions within characters' actions to be a reflection of their complexity rather than an inconsistency? Uh, great question. So, one thing to do is to make them uh, do that different hat sort of thing. Make them consistent in when they're in the same situation again and again, right? Uh, and this can be really great. The reader will start to pick up that when this character's with this other character, they're a bit more of a troublemaker than when they're hanging out with a bunch of adults. Um, if it's not landing for your early readers, um, then you hang a lantern on it, right? Um, you have you do this for a while, long enough that the, uh, the, the readers who like to pick up on these things start to pick up on it. For the others, or for the bulk of readers, or however it's working, you can have the character confront them about it, right? Um, and a character confronting another character, particularly when, as I said, um, if the reader can go back on a second read and watch all this happening, uh, it's really satisfying. Um, and it gives some rereadability to your book. And so um, having a character be like, you know, you are a really good kid, but when you get with that other kid, um, you turn into someone else. You, uh, you, you are willing to, uh, to slide in your morals a little bit or something like that. You know, these sorts of things um, can really add a lot of depth to a book. Uh, and you'll, get, you'll figure it out as you go, but those are two tips. Uh, I'm signing Infinity Blade. Oh, yay. Yes. Uh, Chair found a few uh, cases of this uh, book. That, the second one. Second. First second. one's so hard to find. Yeah. They found a few cases of the, the second one, uh, probably while cleaning out um, their offices to make room for more bags of Fortnite money. <laughs> Um, which, you know, they just have laying around up there. I mean, yeah. Um, oh, they got to put the dump trucks. Somewhere. Yeah, they got to put the dump trucks full of money somewhere. Um, and so they, uh, they're they like, we need this space for, you know, gold bars, Brandon. Here, take these. Uh, so, yeah. We should have uh, Donald Mustard uh, on the stream at some point. See if he wants to come oh, on awesome. and chat about Infinity Blade. That, that way I can and, put Fortnite in the title and yeah. it will be the number one trending thing on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I don't think people like to um, hear from the director of Fortnite as much as they like to hear from the players of Fortnite. Yes, I'm sure. Um, I think that you know Ninja will get more views than the guy who uh, is just talking about all of the boring behind the scenes stuff. But if you're watching this stream, you like boring behind the scenes stuff, and so you probably would enjoy hearing from uh, from the Fortnite director. I think that would be interesting. So I'm yeah. all for it. We'll see. We'll see if he's willing to. Um, um, yeah. So, um, Ari says, you mentioned a balance between dialogue and character beats. Wouldn't uninterrupted dialogue also run the risk of sounding too unrealistic or overly expository? Uh, no. Now, if it's just one person monologuing, then yes. That is the problem with a... Uh, then you get the, you've got me monologuing again, right? <laughs> and that can feel very stilted. But uh, we are used to and accustomed to 
the way that people talk on television, which is actually different from the way people talk in person. You notice that people talk in person, we, number one, we use a lot more fragments of things, but also we tend to talk at length a little bit more. We tend to have, if you, if you wrote down everything we were saying, not just when I'm monologuing to you guys, but in a conversation, you would probably have four or five paragraph long uh, per, per speaker conversations. Uh, because when you're saying that, it doesn't take that long. But in a book, that feels really long. But we are used to the way people talk on television and in movies. And go watch some great dialogue scenes in television, and you will see back and forth, quick character speaking. Um, and when you write a dialogue sequence without a lot of beats, um, and the characters are all in voice, meaning they're all distinctive. They sound different from one another when they're speaking, partially because of their motives and what they want to get out of the conversation. You can replicate that fast-paced. It doesn't have to be Alan Sorkin dialogue or Joss Whedon dialogue, right? You don't have to uh, make it take on the affectation of this kind of very, very on-point banter. But you can just have a, people talking in your normal dialogue, but going back and forth and arguing over something and make it really snappy. And those scenes read real fast and real well. Uh, you can overdo it. I've read some books that that goes on for several pages. Um, and it starts to feel, like you said, it starts to feel stilted in that case. And more importantly, you start to lose a sense of place um, and story. And it starts to feel like just people speaking in a white room and kind of yelling in your ear. But uh, for short bursts and even the occasional longer bursts, these can really speed up the pacing in your story. Part of that is because readers very naturally hit a page and they, they'll be reading along and there's, you know, dense page, dense page, boom, lots of dialogue. There's lots of white space on that page. And they're like, ooh, and they'll start reading faster and it'll move faster because there's lots of white space. And suddenly it just picks up the pace really fast. Um, people, most readers naturally will see that on the side of a page when they're reading this one and they will speed up to get to it because it's so snappy and it, it feels like a, a different change of pace. Um, and so I recommend at least practicing with that tool, even if you decide it's not a tool you want to, to use. Uh, there are fantastic books that don't do that, that, uh, that are very dense and also each uh, line of dialogue comes with uh, heavy modification. Uh, it's just not a style I enjoy as much, but uh, it's it's totally valid valid way to do it. Um, Summer Solstice Solstice says, how many of your current book books book projects do you have outlined, and how many are just thought for now? Oh, um, I could look. <laughs> that might be fun. Uh, do you want me to share that screen? Uh, no, I'll, you know, uh, but uh, <laughs> let's let's put a pin in that one, and maybe yeah. as a farewell to you guys, I will open up um, my folders and see how many I can find that I just have an outline for that I haven't written. I think that would be fun. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here um, that I'm having trouble trying to interpret what they mean, but maybe you'll understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, but this is from the Lightning King. They say. How would you suggest writing the gap in generational values for fantasy culture? Um, so, this is interesting um, and fun to do, um, but boy, one thing you're going to have to decide uh, that I would decide before I do this is I would decide what the technological progress and the societal progress is in your story. We commonly have a big gap in generations right now um, because of those two factors, changing social mores and changing technology. Uh, the biggest one often mentioned is um, cars, the, the first generation of teenagers who could drive and legitimately expected to have you know, a family's second car or third car was a huge difference uh, from the generation before them because of technology, but also changing social mores, right? When kids didn't have to work anymore, they had very different experiences in their youths 
than their parents who might have worked on a farm all through their childhood had. And these things create bigger, more distinctive gaps. And you can have the same thing happening either with technology or changing understanding of magic. Uh, changing understanding of social mores. You know, we, all, we, we often talk about how the older generation views certain things, like perhaps immigration, differently because of the life experiences they have. Um, and this causes that gap to be bigger in our society than it's probably ever been in history. Um, the last hundred years, the last, you know, three or four generations, uh, gaps between different generations were enormous, right? Like the, the gap between my parents and my generation, uh, it was, they were the driving generation. So they had a big gap from their parents. Because, uh, um, you know, my parents are both boomers. Um, my generation, we had um, mass media, particularly nerdy mass media. My parents had no idea what to do about, um, you know, a guy who wanted to be a novelist, right? That wasn't a job. It really wasn't a job uh, for most of history. And, you know, where my parents came from, that's just not, you don't, you don't have that as a job. You don't write books. Nobody does that for a living, right? Um, and you hear a lot more about my generation running into uh, having traction, wanting to be in entertainment, than you do the previous generation. But, of course, my kids are all like, I'm going to be a YouTuber, which is something that didn't exist when I was a kid, but now I am one. Yeah, I was so going to say, they there. just want to follow one of your footsteps. Yes, yeah, so they wanted to be YouTubers before I became a YouTuber. Um, and uh, so ask yourself, like, what are these tension points, right? What is, what is the difference in tension going to be? Uh, one of the really interesting ones happening right now, for instance, is that teenagers now are much less motivated to drive. My generation grew up with our parents talking about the freedom and liberation that driving made. And so when we could drive, when we could get that, um, that uh, driver's license, it was a big deal. It became a big uh, coming of age moment in American culture when you got your driver's license. Why? Because we could then go see our friends and engage in our interests. I could go, you could go to the movies, you go to the bookstore, you could do all of this without needing someone to drive you. Now, you can do that all without driving. And um, you are connected to your friends via a phone all the time if you want to chat with them. Uh, and you want to get a book, you can download it, and that is changing the generation so that the whole coming of age being a driver thing, just not a big deal. Uh, and completely understandably that it wouldn't be a big deal. But it then makes it a little hard to relate when you're like, this was a big moment for me. And your kid's like, do I have to? Do I have to learn to drive? That seems like a really big chore, and they're going to have self-driving cars soon, so why? Right? Uh, totally understandable, but also a generation gap. And so, if you're going to do this in a fantasy world, ask yourself what's going on that, can, that you can use to highlight this gap, um, and the changing morals or so social mores of society, and things like that. Uh, that's what I would recommend. Um, otherwise, if you're not having that, which a lot of fantasy worlds don't have, uh, then you can fall back on the uh, kid who just doesn't have the same dreams as their parent um, and approaches life differently because they just are a different person. You don't understand me, Dad, uh, is something that can happen on any generation uh, on, on the planet Earth. I am absolutely sure kids were saying it in ancient Rome. Um, it's just that Theirs isn't going to be as technologically um, motivated or, you know, social more motivated as it is going to be uh, the, the personality clash. Well, thank you for explaining that answer uh, to your dense employee. Oh. Um, how many more do you have over there? I got maybe 15. 15? Yeah. Uh, do you want to do another question? One or? more question. Okay. Having a good grasp of kind of some of these sociological things, which, by the way, I didn't come up with any of that. I didn't figure it out on my own. Uh, people smarter than me uh, talk about it, and uh, the best thing you can do to be a writer is to listen and then ask yourself, hmm, how can I use that in a story? Uh, and let the really smart people come up with the really brilliant deductions, and then your job 
is to turn them into interesting storytelling. Um, Santiago says, and I'm fairly certain I know the answer to this one, uh, have you ever cried writing a scene? Have I ever cried writing a scene? I do not cry spontaneously, um, be generally. That's just not a thing that I do. Um, I, I've talked before about how my, um, I generally wake up every day feeling about the same. I, I'm the opposite of whatever uh, someone who's, uh, who's bipolar is, right? I'm the opposite of uh, whatever people have really powerful emotions. I don't have them. Uh, if I do, it's generally because I'm reading a really great story someone else wrote. Uh, so crying during scene is not something that generally happens to me. Um, but uh, the closest I come is when I'm experiencing a really great story. And sometimes when something comes together in my stories, I might come kind of close. Closer than I uh, otherwise normally get. Uh, I will say when I was reading Rhythm of War, you, uh, you almost I, got me. I, I, I punched you a couple times. Oh, yeah. It was when... Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to pull open the, the cloud here. I'm going to go to my archive. And let's see what I can find in here that I have outlines for that I haven't written. All right. There's one I know of for sure. I'm not going to tell you what that one is. It's a secret project. Um, one that I haven't talked about. They're going to be really surprised when a book comes out titled Secret Project. Secret Project. It's, going to, it's totally going to get them. Um, so I don't know if we count uh, Death by Pizza. I have a full outline for that. But that's a book I didn't write. And then I did. I passed the world building off to Peter Arulian, who was writing a book based on it, not using my outline. Because the outline was, was had some problems. But that would probably be number two. Uh, dark One. Uh, it became a graphic novel, uh, so I don't know if you count that. That's like half of, um, of one, right? Um, Starburner it would be number four-ish, though some of these. That's the first full outline that doesn't have a book attached to it right uh, now. And let's see. Um, don't know if you count Stormlight 5, uh, but the outline for Stormlight 5 is very detailed. 6 through 10 is less detailed. I do have them, but they're more like a paragraph or two about each book, so I wouldn't count them as a full outline. Um, so let's see, what do we got here? Um, one, two, three, four, five. Five in my, uh, in my novels to write someday, um, <laughs> one, uh, which most of them you guys haven't heard about. One's the magic uh, that uses kites. I talked about that before. These will all be done sometime middle of next week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't do that. Um, ooh, I've got... <laughs> Um, totally not a rewrite of episode one, uh, that I wrote nine years ago. Uh, when would you I, ever release that? No. Uh, but I just could not help it. Um, I would be interested in reading yeah. that if I, if, uh, you'd let, if you'd let me. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Um, but, um, totally not a rewrite of episode one is, oh, you can read it. You, oh, can, okay. you can go read it. Yeah. Perfect. You can. Sorry, everyone. Um, I just wanted to make you all jealous. It's in the book guides folder. Okay. Um, so I have one for Skyward here. What is Skyward? Um, oh yeah, this was Skyward that when I first came up with it from seven years ago, I was coming up with the Skyward outline, the first version of it, in the version of my um, lectures where I wore a hat. You find the lectures with a hat? I only wore it like the first few times. I was trying out a hat. Um, <laughs> then you will find a point where I'm like, I just came up with a cool idea for a book. That was Skyward, and here is the outline for this. It is different. Um, but it still starts with her catching rats, uh, so that's new. There, that's the same. Um, but uh, yeah, um, but that one eventually got made. So you can actually see on the book uh, guides that um, you can see just in that folder I have dark one, um, a different dark one prologue that I wrote, and then uh, Skyward and totally not a rewrite of episode one from nine years ago. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, all right, so I have the five I mentioned earlier. In addition, in their own folders, I have one. I have yeah, I Hate Dragons, which I actually outlined the whole I, I Hate Dragons book, but I only wrote the little piece of it that was a writing exercise. Uh, two, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six plus five, so 11 uh, outlines in my um, novels to write someday. And then, like... 
two half ones that I passed on to someone else, and then all the Stormlight um, and, uh, and Mistborn and things like that that don't quite count. So there you go. Eleven, really, it's eleven uh, only right now. So uh, that's, not, that's not very many. Um, so I would say that I've got at least that many in my head, maybe a few more. So there you go. Oh, and Secret Projects, so that's twelve. And all of those are secret projects too, I guess. <laughs> uh, you've heard about some of them. One of them is like uh, is like the Lurker, uh, which became Adamant, um, which I wrote one novella of, but I have the outlines for the rest, stuff like that. Um, so anyway, hey, uh, here we are. Uh, thank you for hanging out with me again. Uh, we'll be back in three weeks, not two weeks. Uh, in two weeks, we will be eating turkey. Um, and next week, uh, we have the book launch. So I hope that you guys all enjoy Rhythm of War. And maybe when we come back in three weeks, is that when we should do the spoiler one? Or we should probably I'll give do it that the next, yeah, one. next one. So in five weeks, spoiler filled. Um, we'll have to see where that yeah, lands up Christmas. Five -ish, it, it won't be Christmas quite yet, I yeah, don't think. It might just, yeah, yeah. So okay. Somewhere around in there. And in three weeks, we'll be back and uh, be signing more of these things for Taiwan. Uh, thank you, guys. Take care.